Father, I thank you that those, those great, wonderful, awesome things down on the inside of each and every one of us that you have planted there, things of destiny, things of future, things of fulfillment of promises that you have placed inside of us, Lord, accelerate those things and bring to pass the fulfillment of your kingdom and your desire in our lives and through us to the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, Get your uh, sheet and follow along here. We're starting with uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And you know, after Jesus died and rose from the dead, uh, he gave his disciples some instructions. And uh, those instructions were powerful. He said, these signs are going to follow you. Everyone say signs. Say wonders. Say miracles. Say salvation. Now, those are the four things that God wants to bring to pass in a prophetic generation, according to Matthew, or, uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 17 and on. He says, look, I'm going to pour out my spirit on the last day's generation, and, and there's going to be some prophetic things happening and going on, and as a result of that, I'm going to show signs and wonders and miracles, and many will be saved. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so, but in uh, verse 20 of Mark chapter 16, it says, Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Now, I believe that in the generation we live in, there's a lot of people that unless they see some signs, some proofs, some evidences that God is in, our, in, our, in us in this generation, that they're going to have a tough time believing. They're going to have a tough time grasping all of what God wants to do. Today we're going to talk a little bit, though, about human signs, okay? Now, many times when you think about signs, wonders, and miracles, what do you think about? Signs, when I say signs, wonders, and miracles, what pops into your mind? Healing, huh? The Red Sea parting. Walking on water probably would be one. The dead raised. Okay. Well, we're going to look at some examples here in the Bible of some human signs, some things that God told some human beings to do, and as a result of them doing it, uh, God was able to uh, get a message across to a generation. I believe that's what God's wanting to do. He's wanting to manifest himself in a very real way to this generation. I grew up in church, in a denominational church, and I always had a heart for God. I, I was always trying to read the Bible, didn't understand it. I didn't have the reality of God. I just had something inside of me that was hungry for God. And I don't remember really growing up in church anything uh, that was miraculous or that was uh, just, you know, mind-blowing, life-changing power of God, reality of God in my life until later on when my older brother uh, started really walking with the Lord in a more powerful way, and he led me to the Lord. And then all of a sudden, the, just the reality of it started to come. I mean, when I'm driving my Volkswagen to school one day, and it conked out, and I got out, I didn't know how to fix it, and I stood there and remembered something my brother had told me about the name of Jesus, and I said to my car, wasn't saved, you know, and I said to my car, in the name of Jesus, I command you to start, and I got in my little yellow Volkswagen, and it started. I thought to myself, God is real. Okay, so the reality of God began, to me, that was a miracle. You know, you say, well, you know, maybe just there was a, a, a vapor lock or something. Well, maybe there was, but you know what? To me, it was a miracle because it wouldn't start. I prayed, then it did start. God is real. Okay, and that, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here today. God wants to take the words, the message that your life is uh, portraying and begin operating with signs and wonders as a result of it. But I'll tell you this, unless we step in and begin saying and doing those things that God is showing us, we're not going to have the release of signs and wonders in the earth. Because God has chosen, don't know why, but God has chosen to use us. God has chosen that he's not going to work in the earth unless we're involved in it. You know, I, that's just the most amazing thing to me. God uses people to get his plans done on the earth. Just like the devil uses people on the earth to get his stuff done. Okay, so, so here we go. Go over to 2 Kings chapter 13, if you will. 2 Kings 13. And uh, we're going to look at a story here. Uh, Elisha and uh, the king of Israel. Verse 15. We're going to read the story, then we're going to talk about it here. Verse 15. Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows. And he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. 
Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha. He wasn't cussing. He was saying, you know, send the arrow out the window. He, he shot it, and, the, and Elisha said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram. Elisha declared, you will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times and you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. So he told him, see, this is my bow. I bought it, I think, when I was 15 years old. Me and my brother-in-law, whose name was also Spencer, went out and bought some bows and we were, we were going out and having fun shooting bows and arrows. And I, I've got a place set up in the, on our side yard where I go out sometimes and, and shoot arrows and and Jesse's always amazed, you know, it's, we, we set this thing up, and Jesse said, okay, you know, we have this big roll of plastic, and uh, uh, Jesse was out there goofing around with it one day, and he goes, okay, Dad, pretend that's like a guy, all right, shoot him in the right thigh, and I went, thunk, got him, he says, shoot him in the shoulder, thunk, got him, and I'm not really good at this, and I don't really do it very much, but I just enjoy it, and I have fun with it, and I, I, I like doing it, and uh, the Lord's given me words before, remember, honey, when we were in Australia, and uh, Pat Masidi, uh, whom we had just met, was at the convention, and he got up, and he gave me a word about being the arrow of the Lord, and that God was going to launch me into the heart of a generation, and so God has really just used, you know, this principle uh, and this, this picture in my life quite a bit just to speak to me about different things. Elisha tells the king to get an arrow and to get the bow. Elisha put his hands on the king's hands, they pulled it back. Now, I'm not going to shoot anything in here this morning, okay, because I really don't want to hurt anybody. And he pulled it back, and they shot it out the window, and he said, the arrow of the Lord's victory, you will defeat the enemies. Okay, now, shooting one arrow out a window is not going to defeat the enemy. How many of you agree? Okay, but what was he doing? He was acting out a picture prophetically of what God wanted to put in the king's heart so that he could follow through with the picture of victory and he would know what direction to go. Everyone say picture. God works in pictures. And this was a human sign, something that a human being could do that was a picture and a sign to the king of what God was going to do. Then God spoke to him through Elisha and said, take the arrows. So he took the arrows and he said, strike the ground. How many of you would agree that taking arrows and striking the ground does not defeat your enemies? Amen. I mean, have you ever, you know, is you, someone challenges you to a fight, so you get your arrows out and you're going like that. Yeah, that's going to be really scary, right? I mean, this would be scarier than hitting the ground with it. So what is he doing? He's providing a picture the king takes the arrows, and he strikes the ground three times. One, two, three. And the man of God was disappointed. He said, you should have struck the ground five or six times, because then you would have destroyed him completely. What was God doing? God was giving a picture of what he wanted to come to pass. Now, here in your notes, A, realize God wants victory for you more than you do. Okay? That's why God provides these pictures for you. What are you facing right now? What are you dealing with right now? What are you going through? What's the challenge that's in front of you? God wants to give you a picture of victory. And He'll, he'll speak to you. He'll show you a picture. He'll use something. He might even use a movie or, or something somebody else does. Or you're driving down the road and a bird hits your windshield. I mean, God could use any kind of picture to get through to you what He's getting ready to do to bring something to pass in your life. Or even to warn you about something that's coming that you need to be aware of and look out for. But realize God wants you to have victory more than you want to have victory. Everyone say, I win. See, now that's the attitude you're going to move up into because that's the attitude of God. And so God will show that to you. All right, look at B. Be obedient to God's instructions. Do what God shows you to do. Do it, however dumb it might seem. All through the Bible, it's this way. Moses standing at the Red Sea. Uh, Moses says, God, what do we do? What do we do? God says, what have you got in your hand? Moses says, a stick. God says, hold up the stick. 
And I'm sure Moses had the temptation of thinking, yeah, what good is that going to do to an ocean? Holding up a stick does not part an ocean. What does holding up a stick do? Holding up a stick shows that you're obedient and willing to do whatever God wants you to do, no matter how stupid it looks. So God gives you the simple instruction, hold up the stick. He held up the stick. The ocean parted. The man of God gave the king some simple instructions. Take the bow. Shoot an arrow out the window. And then he prophesied, the Lord's going to give you victory. Just like you shot that arrow and that arrow was launched, your victory is being launched. The windows of heaven are being opened to you. And you're, there's nothing going to be standing in your way. God is speaking to him and using a picture to do it. All right, look at C. C, go beyond what is expected. Give it your all. See, when you're moving into the prophetic and you have the basic direction that God's giving you, don't hold back. Go for it. He said strike the ground. He didn't say how many times. He said strike the ground. He could have just stood there all day long, struck the ground. Just done it like four million times. And then he probably would have walked outside and all the enemy would be dead. Striking the ground with the arrows doesn't defeat the enemy. Obeying God defeats the enemy. Okay? So don't be bashful. Don't be shy. And don't hold back. When God gives you some direction, take the direction. Go for it. Give it your all. That's, if, if you've heard me preach for very long, you've heard this story, but I, this is a great time to tell it. There was a young man up in Seattle going to Casey Treats Church. One of the youth leaders there had been working with him. And this guy was a senior in high school, and he had tried several times to start a Bible club, a Bible group, uh, you know, something that would make an impact at his school. He really had a heart to touch the lives of the other young people at his school. And uh, whatever he had tried, it just hadn't worked. And this youth leader had talked with him quite a number of times, trying to figure out a way to make an impact on his school before he graduated and was out of there. And they talked about some different ideas and some different things, but really there was no follow-through. Nothing had happened yet. Finally, this youth leader uh, decided, okay, I'm going to do something about this. This guy's been struggling with this, trying to figure this out. I'm going to help him. So he, he tells the kid he's going to meet him for lunch one particular day at school. He comes out to the school. They have lunch. And then at the end of lunch, he says, uh, come out to my car. I've got something I want to give you before I go. So they go out to the car, and they open, he opens up the trunk, and he pulls out this little three-foot section of picket fence with uh, like a skateboard strapped to the bottom of it. It had wheels on it. And he pulls it out of his trunk, and he hands it to the senior, and he says, here you go. See you later. Got in the car and drove off. Now, this was one of the ideas that they had talked about. And so the senior is faced with a dilemma what do I do with the fence? And so he decides, I'm going to go for it. This was just some creative idea that God had given them uh, how he could make an impact at his school. And so he took his fence, and he went into the school. And he's rolling it along next to him. And he's rolling down the hall. People are looking at him. Going, What's the guy? He's got a fence. What's going on? He's got a... He goes into this first period classroom after lunch. And he comes over to the, the side of the classroom, and he puts the fence up against the wall, and he sits down. The teacher goes, what's the fence for? And he stands up, and he goes, teacher, I just want to know which side of the fence everybody's on, God's or the devil's. And the teacher went, oh. And kids are coming into the class, and, you know, there's a fence against the side of the classroom. And, and you know, they're asking. Someone goes, teacher, what's the fence for? Teacher goes, ask him. So they go, what's the fence for? And so he stands up and he goes, well, I just want to find out which side of the fence everybody's on, God's or the devil's. Oh. And he sits down. He's walking down the hall at school. The principal walks by. The principal says, hey, what's the fence for? He goes, well, I just want to find out which side of the fence everybody's on, God's or the devil's. The principal goes, oh. Keeps going about five feet down the hall. The principal turns around and he says, I'm a Christian. I mean, just the conviction of God. From a fence. It got to the point to where this kid was walking around for days and days with his fence, takes his fence everywhere he goes, coming down the hall at school. What would happen is kids would come around the corner and whatever side of the fence this guy was on, they'd get on that side of the hall. This side of the hall was empty and everybody would be on this side of the hall, on that side of the fence. And they asked him, they said, you look, you know, there, apparently there's something different about you. Would you say the prayer 
at our graduation service at the end of school. And he got to get up there as a result of carrying his fence around. He got to get up at graduation and give this powerful prayer and impacted the entire school with a picket fence. Now, what is that? It's a picture. It's a creative picture. It's very simple. But what he did was simple obedience. He decided the picture that God had given him, the creative idea God had given him, he was going to use it. Now, I am not saying just come up with something goofy and start doing it. Okay? I'm saying pray, find out something from God. What I'm really wanting to do is open you up to the creativity of God today so that when God does show you something creative, that you'll realize, hey, you know what? This is not that big of a deal. I'm going to go do it. In our revival series that we preached on several weeks ago, I talked to you about the revival in Argentina. And it began with like four people, you know, a missionary and and some people that really weren't into it, having prayer meetings once a week and getting in there. And God showed this little servant girl to go over to the table in the middle of the room and slam her fist on the table. But for three days, she wouldn't do it because she thought it sounded so stupid. And she didn't want to look foolish, so she didn't do it. And they encouraged her and they they prompted her. They said, you know, she had shared that God had showed her to do this, but she just couldn't do it. She was too embarrassed. And so they said, okay, how about if we all hit the table first and show you that it's not such a big deal so you won't be so embarrassed, then will you do it? She goes, oh, okay. So they all practiced, you know, taking turns, going over and hitting the table with their fist. And she's like, oh, okay, since everybody else did it, then I won't look so stupid doing it by myself. But when she walked over and did what God showed her to do, slammed her fist on that table, the Spirit of God moved in that place, and revival broke out. A Bible college was born, and it changed. You know, the movie Evita? You know, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. You know, that whole deal, Madonna and the whole thing? Well, uh, Evita was this wicked uh, wife of the guy who was ruling Argentina at the time, she was into spiritism and horoscopes and witchcraft, and she was having witchcraft conventions and horoscope conventions in the country, and out of this Bible school came prophetic utterances that God was going to change everything, and he did. I mean, if Vita died, I think she was like, I don't know, around 40 years old, uh, you know, before her time, because the judgment of God came to that place, and revival broke out, and they took over stadiums. Because a little servant girl took her fist and slammed it on a table. Guys, that doesn't bring revival, but obedience to God does. Amen? (laughs) You say, well, God's showing me something and it looks really stupid. Well, you know what? If you will just simply obey Him and just throw yourself into that, it'll make a difference. It will make a difference. Don't be afraid if it won't. You know, it's just, here's what'll happen. If it doesn't make a difference and you look silly, so what? So what? You gave it a shot. You know? And if revival broke out, or if somebody's life was changed, or if your circumstances turned totally around, you know? I mean, what have you got to lose? Nothing. All right. Turn your Bible over to Isaiah chapter 20. Talk about embarrassing. Let's read this. We're going to read the whole chapter, all six verses. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. In the year that the supreme commander sent by Sargon, king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it, at that time the Lord spoke through Isaiah, son of Amoz, and said to him, Take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so, going around stripped and barefoot. Then the Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away stripped and barefoot the Egyptian captives and Cushite exiles, young and old, with buttocks bared to Egypt's shame. Those who trusted in Cush and boasted in Egypt will be afraid and put to shame, and in that day the people who live on this coast will say, see what has happened to those who we relied on, whom we fled to for help and deliverance from the king of Assyria. How then can we escape? Now, I am not suggesting that the Lord will speak to you and say, take off your clothes and walk around naked, that's Texas for naked, for three years, all right? But uh, there's some points in here that I want you to see that, you know, I don't think, number one, that's against the law here, all right? Back then, I don't think they had any laws that say, don't be naked, you know? I mean, people would be embarrassed and stuff, but, you know, if you didn't have any clothes, what are you going to do? But anyways, God spoke to Isaiah and says, look, I'm going to cause a sign to these people of what's getting ready to happen. 
So take your clothes off and walk around for three years. Three years. That's 365 days times three, whatever that is, 900, 1,000 and, 1,000 and something days. Get a little chilly, I would think. You know what I'm saying? Here's the point, all right? A, this, well, the point is lose yourself in God's word and God's direction. See, Isaiah was willing to do whatever God wanted him to do. Whatever. Even that. Whatever. Everyone say whatever. whatever. Look at someone say Whatever. Okay. God wants you to throw yourself and lose yourself into his word and his direction. A, strip off all self-interest and self-preservation. Okay? Take it off. All right? The kid with the fence, I'm sure he had all these ideas running through his mind. What are people going to say? What are people going to think? What are people going to do? I'm carrying a fence around. Looks stupid. What am I going to, how am I going to respond to that? You know, well, all he had to have is one response. He just got a response and he used it. Okay, but he had to get rid of some self-interest and some self-preservation. He couldn't defend himself or protect himself from ridicule that might come as a result of him following through with this direction, that creative direction that God had given to him. Likewise, Isaiah, he had to take away all self-preservation and self-interest. It's like, I'm not in this for myself. I'm in this for somebody else. See, B, speak God's word concerning yourself. Look at verse 3 again. The Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign against Egypt, and so on, this was the word of the Lord that came to Isaiah, and this is what he said. He said to the people, Just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years. That was the word he had. So he walked around saying, Just as my servant Isaiah, this was Isaiah saying it, just as my servant Isaiah, I mean, it was the word of the Lord, but Isaiah was saying it. So here's the point. Speak God's word concerning yourself. Speak what God says about you. This will help you in the midst of uh, a prophetic type, uh, creative expression that God wants to bring to a generation. You speak God's word about yourself. In other words, like the guy with the fence. If he's thinking, what are people going to say and think? And then he thinks God's word. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That's what God says about him. Well, if God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but he's given me power, love, and a sound mind, I can do this. So speak God's word about yourself, and you'll be able to move forward with the direction that God gives you. And it'll make a difference in people's lives. All right, C, declare God's word boldly. Don't hold back. Declare the message boldly that God wants to give through you, okay? Like Isaiah did. Now, that's, that's pretty bold, you know? And I, like I said, I'm not recommending this. You may get arrested unless you're looking for a prison ministry. Keep your clothes on, all right? I think that'd be good. Now, there was a group of young people uh, maybe about 15 years ago that worked with Maranatha Ministries, Campus Ministry, uh, and their goal, they, they went to Russia... This was before the Iron Curtain came down. And their goal was to get arrested for preaching the gospel and get thrown in Russian prisons to be able to minister to the prisoners in there. That was their goal. Okay, now that's a whole different mentality. All right? It's like, what's your goal in life? I want to go to Russian prison. Well, it's, well that's great. You going to have a family? No, I just want to minister to the Christians in prison in Russia. You know, well, how are you going to get there? Well, I'm going to go over to Russia and preach the gospel and it's against the law, so I'm going to get thrown in. And they did it. They, they went over there and, and did it. Okay, so that, that's like a different mentality. But you see that same mentality in the book of Acts with these guys. They get in trouble. They get called before those people. And they say, look, we'd rather obey God than men. So go ahead. Beat us up if you want. Throw us in jail. We don't care. God's going to take care of it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. We're not going to bow down to your idols. You can do whatever you want. You throw us in the fire. We're not going in. See, they, they, they didn't have any self-preservation. They said, we're going to do what God wants us to do, period. There's no compromise here. And a prophetic generation that God is raising up is going to have that gear and that mentality. See, They're going to have the mentality of, all I want to do is what God wants me to do. All I want to do is affect and impact the people's lives around me that God wants me to impact. And that's an awesome thing. See, 
And maybe it's degrees, you know, I, I've been talking to you about the extremes, but by the same token, we've got to come up from where we are to where God can really, really effectively use us and speak through us and create these creative pictures through us so that the world can see that he's real. Okay? All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, go to Ezekiel chapter 4. You can write that down in your notes too. Ezekiel chapter 4. And I love this. This is so creative. Ezekiel chapter 4, starting in verse 1. We're going to read several verses here. Ezekiel 4, 1. He says, Now, son of man, take a clay tablet, put it in front of you, and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it, erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it, set up camps against it, and put battering rams around it. Then take an iron pan, place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and turn your face toward it. And it will be under siege, and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. Then lie on your left side, and put the sin of the house of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned to you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days you will bear the sin of the house of Israel. After you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the house of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. Turn your face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and with bared arm prophesy against her. I will tie you up with ropes so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have finished the days of your siege. Now let's stop there for a minute, and then we'll read on some more. Look at the picture that God's telling him to do. He says, look, get out in front of the city, and make uh, a little uh, replica of the city of Jerusalem. And lay on your side, and for 390 days, build the city up and knock it down. Build it up, knock it down. Build it up, knock it down. People have to walk right by him, you know, on their way through. Now, here's something, you know, many times, uh, how many of you have ever gone out witnessing? You've gone out with tracks, and you're going to go out, and you're going to share the gospel and stuff. You've gone out witnessing, okay? Uh, here's some that Rick Fox, uh, who's spoken here before, uh, he was sharing with me the other day. Uh, we were on our way back from Austin, and he was sharing something with me I thought was really good. He said that uh, the church in Austin he used to work at, they put up a billboard, and it had a picture of Jesus' hands with the holes in it and everything, and it said, Jesus is the answer. And they had it up for three or six months, I don't remember how long, but uh, they never got one phone call, one inquiry, or one visit from somebody from the community as a result of that billboard. And they were sitting in a meeting, and it kind of dawned on Rick, and so he shared it with the pastors and with the group. He says, you know what, maybe we're offering an answer to a question nobody's asking. They're giving an answer. Jesus is the answer. And if you notice in Jesus' ministry, many times he just sparked questions. Everywhere that he went, he sparked questions. Well, what do you think this does? Here's Ezekiel laying on his side for 390 days in front of the city, builds up a little city, knocks it down. Builds up a little city, knocks it down. Somebody comes up, that sparks a question. Ezekiel, what are you doing? Well, this is what God's going to do to Jerusalem. <laughs> Somebody else comes up, Ezekiel, what are you doing? This is what God's going to do to Jerusalem. <laughs> and it's like, creates this picture you know, and then the people have a choice. They have a decision to make. Either they're going to throw themselves in the mercy of God or they're going to keep going their own way. Now, you know, prophets like Jeremiah, it just amazes me. God says, I'm sending you to a people and they won't listen to a word you say. But you know what? He did it anyway. He, did it. he didn't give up. He didn't say, nobody's going to listen to me. This isn't effective. You know what happened? Years later, Daniel in Babylon was reading the prophet Jeremiah. And in his prophecies, it says, it's going to be this many days, and then I will deliver you and send you back to your land. And Daniel started praying what Jeremiah had prophesied. See, not everything that you do or say or, or stand up for God to express is for that minute in time. Sometimes it's, it's going to be down the road a ways, but what God's trying to do is get the ball rolling and, and, and create some action, create uh, some kingdom stuff that he's trying to get into the fabric of our society. And so it requires us to uh, have that kind of determination. I mean, 390 days. 390 days. You do it about three days and say, this isn't fun. But God said in, in uh, this translation, New International Version, it says, I will tie you with ropes so that you can't move around. Uh, King James or New King James says, I will put my hand upon you so you will have the strength to do it. So let's look at these points here for a second. 
A, follow instructions carefully. God gave him instructions, do this, do it this way. Now remember, uh, in the first point that we were talking about, uh, we're talking about going beyond yourself, going beyond what's expected. You know, he could have done this as elaborately as he wanted to. I mean, he could, have you ever been to the, the, uh, the malls of America in Minneapolis and Legoland? They have Legoland, and it's massive, isn't it, Martin Christie? It's just, it's huge. It's like, it's, it's, all, it's like a park all by itself made out of Legos. I mean, it's just massive. And uh, can you imagine Ezekiel doing that, laying on his side and building Legoland every day and knocking it down? He could have done it as elaborately as he wanted to, okay? But he was following the instructions carefully. I mean, he's, he says specifically, okay? Make a ramp up to it, uh, lay siege works against it, put camps all around it. He, he was doing that, but he could have done it as expressive as he wanted to. But he was following the instructions carefully. B, yield to the Spirit of God and His strength to do it. God said, I'll put my hand on you and you'll be able to do it. The things that you do, don't go in your own strength to do it. The guy with the fence, I'm sure he was nervous walking around school with that fence, but you know what? He wasn't leaning on, on his own strength and his own wisdom. You know, it looked dumb. It looked stupid. It looked crazy. But you know what? He did it. And it might be something as simple as putting a, a, a Bible on your desk at work that's going to speak volumes to your coworkers. Just having a Bible on your desk. God says, hey, you know, put a Bible on your desk. Or carry a Bible around with you wherever you go. Or when you're sitting there waiting for somebody. This doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be laying on your side for 390 days building Legoland. All right? It can be as simple as some little instruction that's going to be a light to somebody that's around you. All right. And see... Look at this. Be passionate for the people to whom God sends you. Be passionate. You're, remember, as a prophetic generation, the things that you do and the things that God leads you to do, they're not for you. They're not for you. When you get up to preach, your preaching is not for you. When I get up to preach to you, I'm not up here thinking, okay, I've got to look cool. I've got to say all the right things. I better read this verse right or they'll think I'm stupid. I don't care. God gives me a message, I get up here and I throw it out there at you. And I do my best and I give it my all, but I'm not thinking about doing my best and giving my all for me. I do my best and give my all because God wants to do something on the inside of you. And I believe God is going to spark some things on the inside of you and bring some things to pass that are just so totally awesome. He's going to release His power through us in some very creative ways, and as a result of it, He's going to bring some cool things to pass. There's lives out there, you guys, that need to be touched and changed, and they're just looking for something. I mean, this is a generation of sight and sound and has to be dazzled by all kinds of stuff, okay? And if we're a bunch of boring Christians just walking around, hi, fine, hello, hello, fine, hi, how are you, fine? That's not a sign. Someone comes up to you and says, hey, how you doing? I am so blessed you wouldn't believe it. That's a sign. And they go, really? Well, Why? And it sparks a question. See how that works? There's people out there that are hungry and thirsty and wasting away because they don't know Jesus. They don't have any peace. They don't, they don't really have a life. They get up in the morning. They go to work. They come home. They watch TV. They go to bed and get up the next day and start all over again. And they're not going anywhere. And God loves these people. And he wants to get their attention. And he's going to get their attention through you and through me in some creative ways. Tony, I didn't ask you to do this beforehand, but I want you to come and share the uh, little story you told us the other night about uh, the trumpet and the abortion clinic, okay? That's because that just touched my heart, and that's right along the lines as this. It's creative, it's prophetic, and it makes a difference. Come on up and share that story with us. I've got a uh, friend. Uh, his name is... Uh, David Hall, and uh, he's real, uh, he d does Operation Rescue. You know what that is? I mean, you change yourself to a, in front of an abortuary and, and, you know, try to save babies and things like that. Abortuary, yeah, right. Uh, um, anyway, uh, but uh, he, he, I've been to rallies with them, and we've gone over to the west side of Fort Worth to the women's clinic over there, and 
we've had three or four hundred people out there standing with signs and placards and gone to the state capitol to to do things and gone here and everything well anyway uh, it's been about five years or so uh, I was working with him over in Dallas and we were working together and uh, he was telling me that uh, somehow we got talking about it he plays a trumpet and he told me how the Lord told him to, he went to this pawn shop and he bought this Bach trumpet. If anybody knows what a Bach trumpet is, it's a real nice instrument that uh, college students use and professional musicians use. And uh, it's just not your old con or anything like that. It's, it's a really nice trumpet. He can't play a lick. So anyway, he starts fooling with it and fooling with it and learns how to play. And, uh, and uh, starts learning how to play. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves the little children you know little simple songs like that so in a way so he's getting proficient so he can play and, and, and do things and uh, at the time he was focusing on the doctors in Dallas in Dallas County who were performing abortions and they had a contract that they would send them and they would get them to sign this contract that they would not kill children and so in a way they'd been pretty successful had been successful here in Tarrant County and had moved over to uh, uh, Dallas County and had been very successful in doing it so I had this one doctor over in North Dallas that wouldn't go so the Lord instructed David that every I think it was every Thursday at noon or one o'clock no matter where he was and he, he's, he's a contractor like me so he's all over the Metroplex but on Thursdays he would stop whatever he's doing and he would show up on that street corner across the street from the doctor's office, take his trumpet and play Jesus Loves the Little Children. And he, did, and he would, dumb, isn't it? He'd go over there, sit on there and, and play. And this guy's not a trumpet player. But he'd go over there and play a couple songs. And I don't know how long he'd spend, 15, 20, 30 minutes. But he'd go over there and, and pray in the spirit and play his, play his song and leave. He did that week after week after week after week after week. Finally, there was a, he went over there and did it. And the next day or just a, a couple of days after he did it, he got a call from this doctor at his home. And the doctor says, I surrender. Please don't come back and play your trumpet anymore. I'll sign anything you want and I'll stop doing abortion. Okay. Now. You know, you don't know what he, the doctor heard inside there and what he heard in the, his heart. Was he hearing Gabriel play the trumpet? We always, look at, we always look at our little, but you don't know what they see and what they hear. Is there, when, when that little girl smashed her hand and that whole thing started, did, she see, did people see an angel in their, in their midst doing that or Jesus doing it? So you don't know. So you got to do the little dumb things because the Lord will take care of the rest of it. Amen. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and finally, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Isn't that awesome? Just played the trumpet. Didn't even know how. I'm sure he thought, what if I look stupid? And then he thought, well, God's shown me to do it. You know, here's the cool thing. Once you do this a couple of times, it really helps you obey the Lord. You know? I mean, God, God might say, get up and go to a certain place, uh, you know, two mornings a week at so-and-so time and just pray for 15 minutes because he's wanting to do something. He's wanting to change something. He's wanting to create something. Acts chapter 4, and starting in verse uh, 29. Now, this is after Peter and John were thrown in prison and threatened and all of this, and they, they came back and told their uh, believer friends, what had happened, and they prayed together. This is part of their prayer. It says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Look at what happened. They got together and say, Look, Lord, they're threatening us. But you know what, Lord? Give us the strength to speak your word boldly. And right while they're praying, the Holy Spirit comes, shakes the place up. You want to shake something up? You know what? Our generation needs some shaking up. Our, our society, our, our culture, 
Our, our area here needs some shaking up, man. People need to wake up. They need to realize that God is real and, and that he wants to work in our lives and he wants to change some things. Ryan, come on up here and get on the guitar. God, I just want to release something. I want you to begin to see what God sees. Maybe you'll see yourself doing something. or You know, I, I like what Jesus said. He says, I don't do anything unless I see my Father see it. Everything Jesus did in his ministry, he saw something in the spirit realm. He saw God doing it first. And all he did was acted like his daddy. You see little kids, you know, imitate their dads? That's all Jesus was doing. He was just imitating his dad. Let's stand up on our feet. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to just get before the Lord. You know what? There's some situations you're facing, maybe at work, maybe personally, maybe financially. I want you just to begin to be open to what God might speak to you or show you what to do. God's very creative and very pictorial. And God wants to either speak to you with His Word in your heart, or he wants to give you a picture of something he wants done. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we release your creative ability. Lord, show us what to do about our finances. Lord, show us what to do about our job. Lord, show us what to do about family members, Lord, who just can't seem to get it together. Lord, show us what to do about friends that we have that, that don't know what direction to turn. They're just lost and wandering around. Father, show us what you want us to do about those loved ones, God. Those relationships that we have that, that don't seem to be doing what they're supposed to be doing, God. But you, you are going to show us what to do. Speak to us. Show us. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, God, I open my heart. I open my mind. My spiritual eyes so I can see what you want to do in me, with me, through me, to me. Change me, God, so that you can change others. I yield myself to your creativity. Show it to me. Speak it to me. I yield to you. Now just, just see it. Just receive it. Just let God show you what to do. You know what? God's showing somebody right now you need to go to that loved one and just tell them that you love them. There, there's somebody you've been having a really tough time with a loved one and God's just, just showing you. Just God's giving you the picture. Just walk up to him and say, you know what? I love you. He's just giving you that picture. And that thing is going to break the strife and, and the spirit of contention that has been between you because love never fails. That's a word for somebody. You just receive that. Take that picture and go with it. Whether you need to call him on the phone or, or go see him in person, God's showing you that right now. God's showing others of you different things to do. God's showing you something to do about your finances, of an offering that you need to give or, or a kind thing you need to do to somebody that you had something, something against. And that'll break that poverty and that'll break that, that lack and that hindrance of your finances flowing. Just yield yourself to the creative picture that God wants to plant in your spirit. There's somebody in here, you've been depressed, you've been lonely, you have felt empty, and God is showing you right now. God has given you a picture of you going to somebody else who's in that same condition, and you're reaching out to them, you're cooking them a meal, and you're bringing it to them, and you're spending time with them, and you're being a blessing to them. Because in the midst of your giving, you're going to find what you need. Get the picture, get the picture, get the picture, get the picture. Father, today you are sparking creative unction, creative action, prophetic action. And Lord, I know that as we take action and do what you're showing us to do, that you're going to give us breakthroughs in every area. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Oh, just see it. Just see it. Just hear it right now. We thank you, God. Just thank him. Just thank him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know what? If you don't know Jesus, just ask Him into your heart right now. I mean, if you've, if you've been walking around just empty and lonely like that, just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be in charge of my life. 
I'll tell you what, when I did that, when I was 17 years old, God changed my life. And he'll change your life too. Father, today, in Jesus' name, we give this day to you, give ourselves to you. Father, we ask you to lead us and direct us. You are so very real. You are so awesome. And all you want, God, all you want is for us to walk with you and talk to you and listen to you and have a relationship with you. Father, we thank you for moving us into a new realm of, of not only awareness of you, but of effectiveness with each other. Do it, Lord. We receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. And the things that God shows you to do, you guys, do it. Maybe God's showing you to go to somebody in this room and just tell them, hey, you know what? There's been stuff between us, and I'm really sorry. And if he's showing you to do that, you know what? Just do it. Or whatever he's showing you, you know? Just step out. Act on it. And let God fix it, change it, turn it around. Because as you do, I'll tell you what, it's breakthrough time. It's breakthrough time. We're a prophetic generation. We're going to step in to the reality of what God wants to do in our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. If you need prayer, come on up to the front. We'll be glad to pray with you. Thanks for coming this morning. Tonight we've got prayer at 6 o'clock and Rick Alltop speaking at 7.30. It's going to be an awesome time. So we will see you later. God bless you. Uh, have fun talking to each other and get to know somebody you don't know. Amen.